Polygamy? The Mormons practice polygamy. Every culture. Well, Mormons were mid 1800s. So every culture. Huh? He looks serious. He's coming in the door. Yeah. <laughs> so, so good morning. Greetings. So polygamy was practiced. Well, the, the last big group was the Mormons. That was mid 1800s, late 1800s. Um, there's nothing in the Bible about monogamy. Um, in fact, many of the patriarchs had multiple wives. Um, Doesn't that partly be for safety of the women uh, in biblical times? In biblical times? If, if your if your your brothers if your brother died, you would take his wife into your home because you would take care of her and her family. Otherwise, she would be destitute. Women were not allowed to work, so women couldn't go down to the store and get a job. Uh, many cultures, uh, women had to stay, you know, wrapped up and behind walls. So Abraham had three wives, uh, Jacob two, uh, David and Solomon had wives and concubines, Moses there's this agreement about Moses, but he may have had three wives. Um, Muhammad had 11, I think. Um, so the cultures back then are not like they are today. Uh, the status of women was they, the cultural requirements dictated that they needed to be protected. Um, well, if you were not protected, there's a good chance that some pretty bad things would happen to you. Um, and slavery was rampant. So, and the interesting thing in the New Testament, uh, the same passages where Paul endorses uh, women staying silent in church, he also endorses uh, slaves to be obedient to your masters. So. Why is one still okay and one is not? Um, do you have any thoughts about last week? Things that you wanted to, to mention? What was your name again? David. David, okay. Tain. David Tain. And what church do you represent? I work for the Church of Christ. For which one? Roswell. Roswell Church of Christ, yeah. okay. There's a lady right here in the red. Yeah. Okay. Well, what are your thoughts from last week? Um, a uh, point that you made, I, I did some research on the fact that the, Jesus never called himself the Son of God. Yeah. But there are some passages that indicate that he did do that. Okay. Um, in John, the 19th chapter, uh, they're, they're Jesus on trial, and they're questioning him. Uh, mm -hmm. When the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify! Crucify! And Pilate said, Take him yourself and crucify him. I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law. And by that law he ought to die because he made himself out to be the Son of God. Okay. They understood his claims. And they said he made, of course, back, back in Leviticus, anything you did like that to shame the name of God so requires stoning. Jesus stoning never him. referred to himself as the Son of God. Well, that's the point. See, these are people who are accusing him in an attempt to get him killed. So that, and by Son of God, in their viewpoint, two things. He's either equating himself with God, and that in itself is blasphemy, getting stoned, or the king of the Jews. And that's what they put on his, on his cross when they crucified him. Oh, yeah. The reason they crucified him, not because he was the king of the Jews, is because they said that he claimed that. But in John the 10th chapter. So crucifixion was reserved for seditionists. Yeah. Here's a guy that named himself king in opposition to Caesar, and because of that he was killed. The crucifixion was reserved for seditionists. So in John the, 9th, John the 10th chapter, a few verses there, my father who's given them to me, 
is greater than all. No one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hands. I and the Father are one. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him, and Jesus answered them, I showed you many good works from the Father, of which of them are you stoning me? Yeah. The Jews answered them, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. Because you, being a man, make yourself out to be God. Yes. And Jesus said, Has it not been written in your law? I said you were gods. If he called them gods, to whom does the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him, whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, you are blaspheming? Because I said, I am the Son of God. He claims there that he had said, I am the Son of God. Okay. And they didn't like that. Obviously, it's very important to you. My question is, if he was the Son of God, why didn't he call himself that? He did. Possibly once. He just says... 99.9% .9 of the time... You question if he was or not? Pardon me? You question whether he was or not? It depends what the term means. Are you talking about a physical relationship, or are you talking about the chief representative? Oh, you sure? you I talk? think you're getting too... Uh, well, the point that he made last week is Jesus said that he was the Son of God. Jesus never claimed to be the Son of God. John, was, John Matthew, the 26th okay. chapter. That is trial. I, I will concede the point to you. He's the Son of God. So, okay. That's well, I'm just saying that he said he was. Well, when Pilate asked him, are you the Son of God? And Jesus said, you said it yourself. He admitted that. Okay. <clears throat> it's, okay, fine. Um, 99.9% .9 of the time he called himself the son of man. So, you know, why do you insist on calling him the son of God? Because this is, this, is, this is something that developed after he was dead. Uh, in a Greek culture, in Greek culture, there's many references to the sons of God. So they're trying to present Jesus to the Greeks, and they have to find some way to present it to them in a way that they would accept. Um, so John 3.16, you know, he didn't say this, but this is what's written about him, only begotten Son of God. But then, everybody in this room is the Son of God, or the child of God, or the daughter of God. So, um, so anyone that believes is a Son of God, or a child of God. Uh, and this is just one passage. There's... So, okay, is there anything else last week that, okay. Okay, so the Son of God is very important. How, how many people is this important to? Okay, okay. I've got no problem with it. The discussion was, um, if he didn't call himself that, why do you call him that? Why don't you call him the Son of Man? Because that's what he called himself. People don't call him the son of man. Yeah. What's important to me is that we're all children of God. Exactly. Sons and daughters of God, children of God. All okay. of us. And not just one person, but all of us. Before you walked in, you spoke last week about Josh Bethel. So here's Josh Bethel's book. The red marker is where he quotes messianic prophecies from the Jewish scriptures that Jesus fulfilled. And if you look at them, um, there's really, most of what he quotes are not even messianic prophecies, and the ones that he do quote, he ignores the context, and I freely admit that Jesus was the Messiah. The, the discussion was, did he fulfill Jewish prophecy? And I can actually prove to you from the book of Daniel that the book of Daniel foretold the birth of, of Jesus. Uh, but, did he fulfill Jewish messianic prophecy in the context of the statements and in a way that could be verified? No, not really. Um, this is for the sake of discussion only because I personally think that he was the Messiah, the Christ. Everything that he claimed to be, I accept. So it's just for conversation. Um, so if you want to look at... Um, Go ahead. Did Jesus, when he talked to the disciples after the resurrection, 
said, These are my words that I spake to you while I was yet with you, that all things must needs be fulfilled which are written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. Did he make a mistake in saying that? That all things were written in the Psalms and the I'm prophets? I'm not arguing against Jesus. The conversation is specific prophecies that he fulfilled. He said he did. Okay. And the conversation that we had was, so name them. You know, what is, what, what's the prophecy, what is the context, and how was it fulfilled? Well, uh, Isaiah you, 7, 13 is one, born of a virgin. Okay. What, what other person do we have in the scriptures that are born of a virgin? Well, virgin births in the region back then were extremely common. A virgin birth? Oh, yes, yes. In the, in the non-Jewish cultures. And that's who Jesus was being presented to, was, was non-Jews. Um, First time I've ever heard that. How is that possible? Okay, first time what? That, that, I've, that I've ever heard that there were lots of other virgin births. Yeah, oh, of course there were, yes. Um, How is that possible? Egypt, it's a legend. Egypt had them, uh, Assyria had them. Uh, he was, that's very common. Um, all of the Greek gods were virgin births. So who were the Greek well, gods? Legend. Yes, exactly. Myths. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So what culture? That's different. What culture was after AD seventy? Jerusalem did not exist, or it was existed. It was totally destroyed by the Romans. Do you accept that? Yeah. Okay. okay. So Israel, as a political entity, no longer existed. Is that correct? There was no king of Israel, there was no... So, where did Paul teach? Where did the apostles teach? Primarily Greece and Turkey. What were the religions of Greece and Turkey? It was the religions of the, the Greek gods. So how were they to tailor their presentation to the people who believed in the Greek gods? The Greek gods, there's many virgin births. They're all the sons of God. Um, I'll show you just a brief one. I didn't want to go into this, but um, let's see. Okay. So Justin Martyr. One thing about Justin Martyr that was different, uh, Jesus and his followers when, they, when everybody was still alive, were all low-class, uneducated Jews. Jesus never went to school. His followers never went to school. They were fishermen. They were farmers. They were shepherds. Uh, one of the interesting things about the Apostle Paul is he was a classically educated scholar. So that's why it was important for Paul to become a Christian. In AD 150, another classically educated Christian was just a martyr. He's called martyr because he was killed for his Christianity. Uh, he's called the most notable of the second century Christian apologists. An apologist is one who argues in defense of the faith. So that's what Justin was. He formerly was a Greek philosopher, wore the flowing robes of a Greek philosopher, became a Christian, and even though he was a Christian, he still wore the robes because to the culture, wearing Greek robes, represented in enlightenment. So they would pay attention to him. So Justin's first apology was written to Caesar, uh, Antonio, Antonius Pius, in reference to uh, the prefect of Egypt, Felix. You can date this to, to about 155 AD. So he's writing to Caesar. This Christian is writing to Caesar in an attempt to get Caesar to stop the persecution of the Christians. Christians were be killed, being killed by the Romans. Why? Why were they killing them? It's because Christians were atheists. Okay. You, you had to buy down and say, Hail Caesar, you couldn't even join a union. Uh, the guilt they had, unless you were bowed down to Caesar and the other gods. 
Well, one of the reasons that Justin Martyr is writing to Caesar is to prove to them that Christians are not atheists. Atheists in the Roman and Greek viewpoint is anybody who didn't believe in the Roman gods. And the Greeks and the Romans, they were the power structure in Greece and Rome. They are the ones that controlled the army. Um, so he's writing that Christians are being persecuted. Justin himself was, was killed in Rome. Um, so he's writing to Caesar in an attempt to get Caesar to stop the persecution of the Christians. Uh, so he provides the emperor with defense of the philosophy of Christianity, uh, explains Christian practices and rituals, and this particular passage is cited as one of the earliest examples of Christian apology, of Christians arguing in the defense of the faith. And this is what Justin said to Caesar. So, and this illustrates the fact that the cultures surrounding Israel and the culture that Christianity eventually developed in, this is the culture that, that Christianity uh, grew up in. So when we say also that the Word was the first birth of God, so here's the, the first birth, the, uh, was produced without sexual union, here's a virgin birth, and that He, Jesus Christ, our teacher, was crucified and died and rose again and descended into heaven, we propound nothing different from what you believe regarding those whom you esteem sons of Jupiter. So who are the sons of Jupiter? Who's Jupiter? Jupiter is Zeus. Jupiter is God. Sons of God. Virgin births. Firstborn. This is the cultural context in which Christianity developed. So the first one he names is Mercury. Um, for you know how many sons your esteemed writers ascribe to Jupiter, to Zeus, to God. Mercury was the interpreting word of all and teacher of all. So um, Mercury was the Roman name, the Greek name for, for Mercury was Apollos. What was the name of the, uh, the chief apologist? Uh, the Apostle Paul, the name is Apollos. He assumed the title, the name, Apollos. It's been shortened to Paul, uh, so that people would listen to him, because Apollo was the messenger from God. Now, anybody with uh, a message Aesculapius, although he was a grateful physician, was struck by a thunderbolt, and so ascended into heaven, and Bacchus too, and torn from limb to limb. So the one on the left, you see the Caduceus, when you go into a medical office today, you see the staff with the snakes on it. This is the scapulous. So he's the son of God. Uh, he died and he ascended into heaven. Bacchus II, the god, is the god of, of wine. So in the beginning of Jesus' ministry, he went to a, um, a wedding. What did he do? Changed water into wine. That's what Bacchus did. So you can see the parallels. I'm not saying that Jesus was not authentic, what I'm saying is this is the cultural influence that the Greeks had on the, the development of early Christianity. Hercules. Hercules was a demigod. Half man, half god. Zeus had come down, had sex with his mother. He was born from the product, so he was half man, half god. Um, Sons of Leda and Dioscuri, Perseus, ascended into heaven. This wasn't actually, Perseus didn't go into heaven on Pegasus. Uh, it was Bellerophon who ascended into heaven. So, there's stories in early Christianity of, of Christians ascending into heaven. Um, so what shall I say of Ariadne and those who like her? Been, so, some of the, the uh, mythological figures became the constellations. The emperors who die among yourselves, um, the Romans burn their dead bodies. So Caesar is on the burning pyre, and they produce a witness who says that they have seen burning Caesar rise to heaven from the funeral pyre. But keep in mind that this is written by a, a Christian in AD 150. 
to Caesar. What kind of deeds are recorded of each of those reputed sons of Jupiter? So who, Jupiter was Roman, the same god in Greek culture was Zeus. The founder of Judaism is Moses. The founder of Christianity is Jesus. What's the prefix of, of the suffix of both the names? It's Zeus. Mo Zeus, Jesus. You know, is that a culture or is this something designed to make Christianity appealing to a Greek audience? Uh, Jews would call Moses Moshe, and Jesus' name originally was probably some variation of Joshua. Yeshua or something like that. It wasn't, in fact, there's not even a J in, in uh, the Greek language. So. Uh, it only said, shall be said that they are written for the advancement and encouragement of youthful scholars, for all reckon it an honorable thing to imitate the gods. So this is the Christian's concluding statement in the letter that he wrote to, to Caesar. But as we have said above, these wicked, wicked devils perpetrated these things. So his concluding argument was, even though the stories of the Greek gods and the story of Jesus are all the same, uh, only the story of Jesus is true. And that was just a murder. I don't say this to, uh, oh, okay. So on the left is Bellerophon ascending into heaven astride Pegasus. On the right is Jesus from the book of Revelation descending from heaven on a horse, followed by an army on horseback. So the question was, People didn't know that there were virgin births in other cultures around Israel at the time. Uh, there definitely were. Uh, There's a difference between a myth and reality. I totally agree. So, was did Greek culture have an impact on the development of early Christianity? That's the question. Okay. So. Every culture, every country where Christianity developed impacted the thinking of Christians. You saw the, you see the impact that England had on the development of Christianity during the Protestant Revolution. The Christianity that came out of Europe was different than the Christianity that came out of England. Um, and many of the uh, European ideas that had made their way into British thinking, um, these people were burned at the stake, they were drowned, early Baptists were drowned, they, they gave them a third baptism and they drowned them. Uh, they burned at the stake, um, so people like, um, well the founder of the Baptist Church, John Smith, had to flee to Amsterdam. Amsterdam was the site of Arminius, Jacob Arminius, uh, Arminius was a counterpoint to Calvin. John Calvin says everything is predetermined. Arminius said, no, you have free will. So this is the big argument back then. Um, the people in England, if you're not real careful, we'll get you burned at the stake, or drowned, or killed, or, or lose your job, or any of the above. There were blasphemy laws in England that you pretty much could not deviate from uh, official church doctrine, or you would be, well, initially, you would lose your job. Then you would be prosecuted and fined, and then you would be either imprisoned or killed. These are the blasphemy laws of, of, of England. Uh, one person that wrote about this was Isaac Newton. Newton pointed out some inconsistencies in the Bible, but he could never actually come up and officially say it until his statements were published after his death because he would have lost his job. Um, so Arminius was the founder or 
highly influenced the Methodist development of thought and the Church of Christ. So, uh, and all these things came out of the early mid 1500s. Um, so, um, Barbara, in the first class, and what is your name? Doris. Doris, okay. Both asked about Baha'i, so I developed a presentation about Baha'i. We've got some Baha'i sitting here, so when the presentation is done, you can ask them the questions. Um, so I went on Facebook and I looked up uh, Barbara Helton. <coughs> Oh, gee, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so Barbara's neighbor is Josie Reynolds. Is that right? Okay. Yeah, in, in Rome. That's on my, my bucket list is, is Rome. Um, so do you know Josie? Yes, okay, you know Josie. So, um, so I, I was asked to do a presentation on Baha'i and any of these presentations are difficult because you can only hit the highlights, so I'm just going to... Uh, Even days. though I don't believe this thing as they do, I respect their religion and their celebration. Of course. So. And it's vice versa. Yeah. Yeah. So there's... Yeah, she tells a, me Merry Christmas, so... Yeah. <laughs> you know. Why not? Of course. Uh -huh. when they do away. And that's the purpose of this class yeah. is to promote tolerance. Well, you don't have to believe what the other person people. believes, but you can let them believe it. So this is the Baha'i Faith web page on the internet. Uh, it says, let your vision be world embracing. It says, throughout history, God has sent to humanity a series of divine educators known as manifestations of God, whose teachings have provided the basis for the advancement of civilization these manifestations have included Abraham, Krishna, Zoroaster, Moses, Buddha, Jesus, Muhammad, and Baha'u'llah is the latest of these messengers, explained that the religions of the world come from the same source and are, in essence, successive chapters in the one religion of God. Baha'is believe the crucial need facing humanity is to find a unifying vision of the future of society and the nature and purpose of life. Such a vision unfolds in the writings of Baha'u'llah. So Baha'u'llah announced that he was a messenger of God for humanity today and declared that his mission was to usher in the age of peace and prosperity prophesied in the scriptures of the world's great religions. He said that the essence of all the prophets of God are one and the same. Uh, Baha'u'llah lived in the mid-1800s. He was born in 1817 and he was born into one of the oldest royal families of Persia and they actually have genealogical charts that can trace him literally back to Abraham. So Baha'i is an Abrahamic religion. Uh, so uh, Isaac, Moses, Jesus, uh, Muhammad, Baha'u'llah, all trace their family line back to Abraham. Uh, and Baha'u'llah wrote, Verily I say this is the day in which mankind can behold the face and hear the voice of the promised one. The call of God hath been raised and the light of his countenance hath been lifted up upon men. Uh, so there is a Baha'i Center in Marietta. They're on Sandy Plains. Yeah, Sandy Plains. Uh, so there are quite a few Baha'is in the area. One of the statements of Baha'u'llah is to consort with the followers of all religions in the spirit of friendliness and fellowship. So that's what you were just talking about. Mm -hmm. So what did Baha'u'llah teach? What, what does he want people to do? He said that there really is a God. Humanity is from one family, so all barriers between people should be overcome, particularly racial differences. Women and men are equal. Families are important. It's okay to think for yourself. Science and religion can agree. We were created by love to live in joy. Our souls are immortal. 
Uh, there should be economic and environmental problems can be solved by spiritual principles. And that we are living in the age of the dawn of peace, we're told by Isaiah. And the back one, the one on the right, says, uh, Baha'u'llah wrote that women and men have, have been and will always be equal in the sight of God. So just to show, give you a glimpse of some Baha'i architecture. Has anybody seen this building? It's in Illinois. Okay, just north of Chicago on the lakefront, the Baha'i House of Worship. Um, in Chile, in India, these are all Baha'i Houses of Worship. Samoa, Australia, Germany, Panama. So to give you a little uh, sketch in just a, a few things from a biblical perspective, the graphic on top is, is a Seventh-day Adventist graphic. William Miller is considered to be one of the founders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, capital of the Bible prophecies. This one in particular is the book of Daniel. Uh, in Matthew 24, Jesus was asked, when will be the sign of the return of the presence and the end of this age or dispensation? And he referred people to the abomination of desolation prophecy in Daniel. So the chart on top is the abomination of desolation prophecy. The first part is a 70 week prophecy, which comes out to about 32, 33 AD. And this, this according to Daniel is when the Messiah was born, or when the Messiah would have been killed. Um, so the first part of Daniel, the 70 week prophecy foretold the death of Jesus. The second part, the 2300 day prophecy, uh, foretells 1844. And 1844 is when the Baha'i faith began. Uh, Baha'u'llah had a forerunner. He assumed the title of the Bab. So similar to John the Baptist who appeared before Jesus. Uh, Isaiah and Micah are very similar in the, in the uh, content of their books. Isaiah said to come in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established and all nations shall flow into it. Isaiah ends his book by saying that all nations and tongues will be brought together to worship before the Lord. And Micah 4 reflects this statement from Isaiah in the last days to come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord should be established on the top of the mountains. So what mountain is this? So Isaiah said, the wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them, and the desert shall blossom as the rose. Uh, the excellency of Carmel and Sharon, they shall see the glory of the Lord and the excellency of our God. That's Mount Carmel on the left in 1900. It's Mount Carmel right now. And these are the Baha'i properties on Mount Carmel. Baha'u'llah was exiled uh, successively from Iran to Baghdad to Constantinople to Europe and Adrianople, and then finally to Mount Carmel and Akka in Israel. Are all these buildings on the left? Are they like apartments or homes? Or what are those on the left, yeah. it's just a, a, barren, a barren rock. Mm -hmm. On the left of... No, I mean on the left. On the, on the right side. Mount yeah, there are... Now, what, what are those apartments? There's all kinds yeah. of apartments. It's a city. Yeah, it's, it's, a, city. it's, it's a city. It's a city. Yes. city of Haifa. So Mount Carmel used to be a barren rock. Now it's one of the most beautiful gardens in the world. Okay. The Jewish Chamber of Commerce of Haifa calls the Baha'i properties the eighth wonder of the world because it would be impossible to build a garden like this. Uh, so Sharon should be a fold of flocks in the Valley of Achor. This is Isaiah again. So Achor is Akka. Uh, the excellency of Carmel and Sharon, they shall see the glory of the Lord. Uh, the name Baha'u'llah means the glory of the Lord. Uh, when, ransom, when, the, when the ransom of the Jews shall return. So one of the key statements in the Bible is that the Messiah will come when the Jews return to Israel. And Isaiah actually says that the Messiah will appear and gather the Jews back to him. So the Jews have returned. It also says that knowledge will be greatly increased. That's all happened. <coughs> and then Baha'u'llah said that he was the one that was foretold by Isaiah. Let me 
awareness is that the high properties are not terrible. Oh, that's great. It's fabulous. It is. It's just exquisite. Have you been there? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Okay. So on the left, there are four buildings. On the right, there's uh, is it 19 terraces go all the way up to the, the mountain. You're up to the top, yeah. above the building. So, the Baha'i Faith, the second largest religion of Iran, is the Baha'i Faith. Um, that's where Baha'u'llah was born, that's where his forerunner was born. So when Ayatollah Khomeini came back from exile in France in the late 1970s, he had two stated objectives. One was to oust the Shah, which he did, and the other is to kill the Baha'is. So this is what Khomeini said. He called Baha'is a deviant sect, apostates is unclean. Uh, the Ayatollah on the right says the Baha'is have no citizenship rights. Uh, so this is happening right now. The whole thing with Nazi Germany and the Jews in World War II, it's happening right now again <coughs> in Iran. So what they initially did is they decided to cut off the, the, the head of the leadership of the Baha'is. So 1978, for the last for the last 20 years, uh, they started killing the Baha'is. They would arrest them and they would disappear, and then they would be found in shallow graves. So the New York Times wrote an article: uh, Iran's Baha'is, some call it genocide. Uh, the article on the bottom right: To kill Baha'is is a good deed. Baha'is have no no uh, civil rights, so they have no protection under the Constitution. You could walk up and shoot a Baha'i, and <coughs> no policeman would ever arrest you. So at the same time, 10 women were teaching children. They were arrested, and they were hung one at a time while the others watched. And okay, why did they want to kill the Baha'is? Because they're apostates, because it's not Islam. Islam teaches that Muhammad was the last prophet. Baha'is say another one's come. So Islam itself has Messianic prophecies that Islam will be renewed. But every time a prophet of God has appeared in history, he's opposed. So Jesus was opposed. We just read the passage about the Jews opposing Jesus. The exact same thing is happening right now. So the youngest of the women who was killed was a 17 year old girl. She was the last to be hung. She kissed the noose, placed it around her neck. For teaching children's classes. For teaching children's classes, yes. So the UN knows about it. Uh, the Baha'is actually have consultative status at the UN. They're in non-governmental organizations. Uh, in Yemen, Yemen is primarily controlled by uh, Iran. But recently, this is uh, <coughs> May 17th of this year, hundreds of Yemenis led by tribal leaders gathered to protest the arrest of Yemeni Baha'is. Bandar Abbas is a city in the southern part of Iran by the uh, Strait of Hormuz. Um, so since um, the last 38 years, more than 200 Iranian Baha'is have been killed or executed. Others have been imprisoned. Tens of thousands have lost their jobs. Uh, Baha'i children are not allowed to go to college. It's hard to believe in this. Modern day and time, but that's Iran. Isn't it? This is Iran. Mm -hmm. yes, um, yes. Right now, there's about 90 Baha'is in Iranian prisons. And when they, before they're killed, they're given the opportunity to convert to Islam or be killed. So if you convert to Islam, it saves your life. If you don't, then you're killed. Um, so the same thing's happening. The one on the right is interesting. It's uh, Oregon. So there's a Baha'i there that came home one day and found his house <laughs> trashed and spray paint, uh, get out of the USA terrorists. But Baha'is are not Muslims. Um, so it, Again, not understanding. Uh, mm -hmm. total, mm -hmm. total ignorance. Mm -hmm. So on the left, um, Baha'is actually tried to form their own secret universities and online uh, Baha'i is probably the most literate group in Iran. If not, it's right up there. So education is highly prized. Mm -hmm. um, 
On the right side, the high businesses are being closed. <coughs> so to a little bit lighter note, give you an idea of what some of the highs in Atlanta look like. I don't think I see Josie in there anywhere. But just different meetings around Atlanta. These are all on Facebook. <coughs> so the Atlanta area, I think there are five Baha'i centers in Atlanta. There's one right downtown, it's about two streets over from the King Center. Um, Baha'is in the 1940s used to have uh, multiracial <coughs> meetings, and they, the police actually came and told them you can't do that. So, so the center was built about 1950 on um, down Edgewood Avenue. I'm waiting for it to come into the <coughs> Auburn district because it, it was one of the first places where uh, interracial meetings were held in Atlanta. Yeah. So the picture on the upper right is somewhere in the Pacific. Lower left, I think, is Africa. Upper left is Dizzy Gillespie. It's a prominent Baha'i. Lower right is Seals and Crofts. So this is kind of saying about Baha'i and their music. Uh, Andy Grammer is a modern musician, popular Dan Seals. Uh, Justin Baldoni, what shows what he's been on many shows on TV lately. Uh, Kevin Locke in the bottom. About ten percent of the Lakota Indians are Baha'is right now. Um, and various places in around the world. So I'm going to end with a Baha'i quote. It says, do you know the day in which you are living? Do you realize in what dispensation you exist? <coughs> have you not read the Holy Scriptures that at the consummation of the ages, there would dawn a day, the sum total of all past days? This is the day when the Lord of hosts hath come in the clouds of glory. This is the day in which the inhabitants of the world shall enter under the tent of the word of God. This is the day whose real sovereign is His Highness the Almighty. This is the day when the East and the West shall embrace each other like unto two lovers. War and contention shall be forgotten, and nations and governments shall enter into an eternal bond of amity and conciliation. This century is the fulfillment of the promised century, the dawn of the appearances of the glorious visions of past prophets and sages. So, any questions you have can be answered. These people. So, is he a real man or a God? Supposed to be God. Was he a real man? A man that. Yes, he was a real. Yes. Yes. But all was a real man. And so he made up his own doctrine and for people to follow? Well, he wasn't God. We believe that God led him, you know, that he was, you know, representing God just like Jesus. Um, so you have a, a Bible. You have we have. He, he wrote over a hundred volumes. Would you believe? And that God told him to do this. Yes. Yes. Can I read a passage for you? Certainly. Matthew 17. Mm-hmm. And after six days, Jesus taking Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringing them up into a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun and his remnant was white as light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Eliza, talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here, if thou wilt. Let us make here three tabernacles, one of thee, one for Moses, and one for Eliza. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud, which said, this is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. So there was only supposed to be one, one tabernacle made, and that was for Jesus Christ, not for Moses, not for Eliza. It wasn't supposed to be a Baptist. It wasn't supposed to be a Methodist, Jehovah Witness. Just one. Well, what they were saying is that they're seeing three people standing there, and they said, "Should we?" build three shelters right. for all three. Mm -hmm. And as they're walking down the hill, Jesus tells them, do not 
tell the tell vision to anyone. Right. Mm -hmm. in, in the original Greek, it's uh, it's uh, aram, arama aptasia. It's mm -hmm. heavenly vision. So what, so this what is the point? I, so what this reminds me of is several years ago, where uh, in Texas, where this man had all these followers, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. they killed themselves because of. Mm -hmm. um, they followed him. Mm -hmm. David Koresh? Yeah. 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 This Waco. sounds like, you know, the Baja thing. No, 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 no. Similar to that. No, 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 no. No, no, no. no. no I think not so, anything like that. Well, Baha'is yeah. have never killed themselves, and the fact they're being killed by the Iranians and well, not But I know what you're saying about so. that, because they were following a man. A man. Yeah, and see, like they've been studying. It's not a cult. Can you call that a cult? No, that's not a cult. Like we have been studying in this class, there are many uh, prophecies in the Bible and in other holy scriptures that tell us about this day. Uh, the disciples went to Jesus, and, and I'm, I am not quoting because instead we don't understand what you're saying. And he said, well, when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will explain all things. Well, we believe that the Spirit has returned in Baha'u'llah. And that so he's explaining some of these things to us that we couldn't understand because of our spiritual immaturity. There's also a place, if you look it up, it talks about he will have a new name. What does that mean? You don't think it meant Baha, do you? Mm -hmm. I think so. Mm -hmm. See, it, it, it you just, you have to continue to study and continue to learn and pray. If this is the greatest day of God, then you have to pray that you will be led to understand these things. The difference in a cult like David Koresh is that he was saying that he was the almighty that they should all look mm -hmm. to. Uh, these other religions are not saying that. They're different religions that all lead back to God mm -hmm. uh, in just a different path, maybe. Mm -hmm. and just in the there are many references in the Bible about the glory of God. And if you look, you can find them all through the um, Old Testament. And it talks about the glory of God being a man that he stood by the river Shagar, and that he went here and he went there. The glory of God, Baha'u'llah. That he appeared in all these different places. Every time you see the glory of God in the Old Testament, pretty much so they're referring to Baha'u'llah, which means the glory of God. So he was specifically talking about Baha'u'llah, not being the man, just this one man. Yeah. This was a, a man just like Jesus was a man. All of these manifestations, as we call them, manifest the qualities of God. So do you believe in Jesus that, Christ? Oh, oh yes. yes, very much. I grew, up, I grew up at First Baptist Church in Lincoln, Georgia. And I went to Mercer University. I minored in religion there. And I became very, very confused as to the literal interpretation of of uh, of the scripture, my Old Testament professor talked about. He would stand before an audience, a class, and he would say to start reading from the Bible, the Old Testament, and then he would look up and just continue repeating that. And he talked about the windows of heaven opened up, and he said, "You have to see any windows up there." He was pointing to me. To don't look at that literally. Look at that spiritually. And so that was, I didn't really realize what he said at that time. But I had my doubts for years. And I was not introduced to the Baha'i faith until I was 28 years old. Now this has been 53 years ago. And so uh, I have just if I could give my life a Baha'u'llah, I would. I would. There's, there's something about, you mentioned 
Christ told the disciples the Spirit would come. But the passage in John 16, he said, He shall come, and he shall declare it unto you. He said, He shall guide you into all the truth. It was all the truth revealed to the disciples in that first century. Yeah. Jesus well, said, I... Jesus said it was. Jude says, Jude says the faith would have been once for all delivered to the saints. Paul wrote to Timothy and said the scriptures inspired of God are profitable for all things that pertain to life and godliness. So when this is finished, I believe it was finished and there is no new truth, there is no new Messiah, there is no new, you know, religious leader to come other than what we have in the scriptures here. I believe all knowledge comes from God. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was God. The Word was with God. And I believe God guides us. He will continue to guide us. There are different messengers. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> well, because we're not, we were not ready. We were not ready. Well, we were not ready for some of the things that Baha'u'llah has brought when Jesus came. But he has some new revelations. He has a new revelation, yes. This, but says, added, no, added, but, this but, says this is complete. It says there is no new truth to be revealed than what was revealed in the first century to the apostles. And well, it was all written I, down I, like the, I, I don't believe that because I believe that God That's never, God said. It's a covenant with, with, we have a covenant with God and he will never leave us alone. And he's continually guiding us. And we have a different set of situations in the world right now than we had when Jesus came. And so... That's just the way I believe. Mm -hmm. but, but Jesus said that all truth yeah. would be given to them at that time. Mm -hmm. Jude says the faith, the system of faith, has been once for all, for all people, for all time. It's been delivered. Well, you can see that if we all study scripture, whatever scripture that is, we are guided. If we don't, if we turn away from that, we lose our guidance. We lose our connection with God. So the Apostle just, Paul wrote after Jesus and he says right now we see as in a glass darkly a poor reflection on a poor mirror. He says when this time comes we will see that, as if when that which is perfect has come that was unfortunately done away. Right. Miracles, tongues, all these you know. In the book of Daniel and in the book of Revelation it Depending. describes a time when the books will be unsealed. Mm -hmm. So That's up until this happens, the books are sealed. They're not sealed now. We, we read, we have understanding. Okay. So the Paul book of said, Revelation and the book of Daniel. When is, you read what I've written, you can have my understanding into the mystery of Christ. Okay. So even the common person, you know, some churches say only the, the uh, clergy, only the ordained people, you know, can understand it. No, Paul said, writing to common people, when you read what I've written, you can have the same insight into the mystery that I have. Well, can you go back to what they, that full page of what they were saying, what they want to see accomplished. Sure. Go back to that because that says it all. That's well, the same and basic principle of the Bible or whatever. I want to emphasize the that, piece, right? that um, and the very first thing I said at the beginning of this class is that all viewpoints are valid. All viewpoints are allowable and acceptable. Your viewpoint is acceptable. Uh, but you know that whole page, mm -hmm. what the purpose or what the what the vision or what the. So I appreciate uh, the counterpoint that you're offering. Um, that's okay. That's good. Well, there was another. There was another. Uh, it was. It was like. There was another one. Not this, but not the more talking about people living together and all that. Yeah, stuff. the last. The no, last quote that you said. It covered the whole screen. I think. Yeah. Okay. Let, let me, yeah, let I covered the full screen. Christ with said he was in the comforter. Mm -hmm. This one? You know, so who is that comforter? Oh, you like this, so you think that's the comforter? Yeah, well, uh, yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, it's interesting also that the book of Revelation describes the return of the Christ as a battle where people oppose him. So every prophet that has ever appeared has been opposed. So, do you know anything about the high? Did, did you know anything 10 minutes ago? Well, I've seen the building there on the 
Sandy Plain. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah. I've seen it, and I was wondering what was But do you know anything about it? No. Okay. It's interesting that 10 minutes ago you didn't even know what it was, and yet you immediately attack it. It was yeah. an attack. Well, it a question. Okay. Question it. Don't say she attacked it. She okay, attack. she immediately questioned it. We Question, find questions. questions are good. The thing that's important to me is that while I was raised in Christian faith and I, my getting to where I am was a totally different path mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. from what my friends took. Uh, I think Bruce was raised uh, in, in another faith and Josie mm -hmm. was raised in Baha'i. So, you know, one converted and the other one was raised that. But um, what I have learned from being around them and and others in their in their faith, I've been in groups before and where they've had meetings in their homes, and I've been invited. Is that they are some of the most um, peace loving people that I have ever seen. Their basic philosophy is to get along with everyone and to um, love everyone, to promote world peace, and and um, they're, they're probably some of the kindest people I've ever known. And so how can you argue with whatever has gotten them to that place? You know, I mean, I, I just can't do it. I can't, um, and raised in a, you know, in the South, in, in a, mostly in the Methodist Church, I've not been exposed to uh, other religions like that until I was grown. And so it would be very easy for me to, to say, no, I, I don't buy that. But I can't do that because I see the product. You shall know them by their fruits. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. So I can't question. Thank yeah. you. And Thank people you. are so. Thank you. Yes. And I feel that people are so so are very self righteous mm -hmm. when they are judging other people and thinking that their thoughts or beliefs are the only. That's the only right way. So if I believe in Christ as the one, then I'm being self-righteous if I would agree that the Muslims are true in their religion and they're serving God. Yes. Mm. Yeah, and well, I don't think it's wrong to believe I what don't you think believe. It's wrong either for you to believe it, but I, I think it's self-righteous. I don't want to judge him because I don't accept Muslims. Well, have you ever read the Quran? Uh, I've got I've got a Quran, Have you read and it? I've done work in Muslim nations where what I do is against the law because it's forbidden to teach the gospel to Muslims. Uh, so, what questions I've, do we have I've about the Quran? Is there any other questions, or should we continue? We've got 25 minutes left. Is that behind uh, Sand Plains Road? Is that is that close? Is that building close to the Unity North Church? Pretty close, yeah. Unity North is about North two or three North miles North farther North down. North. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I used to, I used to go to Unity North, but yeah. so far from Potter Space, yeah. I don't go there anymore. Well, we mostly meet in homes. Oh, you do? We mostly meet in homes. Don't you live in Potter Springs? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes. So we have, you know, all right. And You're welcome. You're welcome. We, You're welcome. Yes, we, we have uh, just... Um, I'm looking at everybody's back. Um, <laughs> <Very good. laughs> we have informal get-togethers where we just continue the discussion like we're here. We're all learning how to be tolerant. We're all learning how to understand each other. We didn't get here by signing a card or, or declaring something. We're working on this. It's a working process. Boy, we just and so the, the, the more we can work together to overcome some of this so that we can learn to love each other whether we're you know jesus said love your neighbor what well, he meant love your muslim neighbor love your gay neighbor i don't have to agree with you but exactly. that's 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 where we are if we're not going to have world peace 
if we can't move to that level of acceptance of each other just for who we are. And then the strike that piece is in ourselves too. You exactly. Well, and then you have more. Then it exactly. Can spread out a little bit to if you are expressing hate or yeah. for somebody else, you're affecting your own soul. Yes. 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 And you know, your own physical body. Exactly. It, it can make you physically so ill. expressing hate in here? Oh, nobody is expressing it. I'm just saying in general. I'm just saying in general that that. She said, you know, that we are loving and kind but and there whatever. there are people who do hate other exactly. people they, who yes. don't believe the same way they believe. Yeah, so they well, immediately so dismiss it. And I mean, hate has just manifested itself on what, what, Sunday night or whatever with the, with the, the exactly. England, Manchester. Exactly. Yeah, we we see, the, see it all around us. Hate. So, okay. so what you are showing that's happening in Iran is certainly hate. Worshiping the Yes. yes. So well, in those, in those, um, Baha'u'llah well, wrote over a hundred volumes, and we have a governing body called the Universal House of Justice, and it is elected. And they feel a responsibility to mankind to be sure that all of these writings are translated and made available so that anybody can go to these writings and read for themselves and understand for themselves what Baha'u'llah brought. And are they housed in these buildings? Okay. They're also available online for free. A lot of things are available online. And, and, and I'm learning a lot about the translation process. We've talked a lot about how culture and everything went into translating the Bible. And, you know, in its essence, the Bible is, is God's word. When I I've been that. to these <laughs> gatherings at their house, they would invite neighbors, regardless of what the religion was. Mm -hmm. and they would hand out sheets of quotes from your readings, some from the Bible, uh, for different ones to read. And I had never had any problem reading them because so the what it said was always something that I couldn't take objection to. Yeah. So do you guys have preachers? Yeah. You have preachers? No preachers. So who teaches? We, we teach each other. We teach we, each we, other. We study. What do you teach? There's from? no clergy. Uh, we teach from the Baha'i writings. We uh, teach from the Bible. Teach from we teach from all of the different religions that have been revealed by God. They're all. I'm. I'm still a Christian and I'm a Muslim. <laughs> I'm all of these different faiths and I'm a Baha'i because Baha'u'llah came and he explained all of the past religions to me for my understanding. Now my understanding is pretty lacking, I should say, but I keep reading and trying to understand the writings of Baha'u'llah, <coughs> how they're all connected. And this is what is promised, the kingdom of God. That's why I think it's so The kingdom of God is what's promised mm -hmm. to us from ages mm -hmm. and everything. Will I be alive when Jesus returns? Mm -hmm. That's a question that people all, is Jesus the return of Christ? Is he or is he not? Now, if he is not, that's going to be. <laughs> if he is yeah. not, then the Baha'i faith is the biggest fraud that has ever been perpetrated by mankind. He either is or he's not. And I just, you know, challenge you in a way to go to Baha'i.org and look for yourself. We can't convince you of anything. I've studied the Baha'i faith for a year before I became a Baha'i. Because one thing I didn't feel I was worthy. But it's a never ending educational process to really go onto your computer, your iPad, or wherever they and go to Baha'i.org and it will send you all over the place as to what the Baha'i faith is. If it doesn't sound white what we've been talking about then you need to be very careful because there are people out there that are trying to subvert the Baha'i faith so you have to be very careful about that but the other thing is that we continually need to pray to God to give us the guidance for our spiritual path yes. wherever that is going to take us let him guide us Mm -hmm. So do you pray to the God of Jesus? Mm -hmm. Yes? Okay. 
So if someone wanted to come to one of your meetings, how would they do that? What do you mean? And? I'm sorry, what? If someone wanted to come to one of your get-togethers? Yeah. How would they do that? Oh, well, you just tell me you want to come and we'll... <laughs> <laughs> I just may show up on the doorstep. Yeah, just give me your address. <laughs> well, I'm behind the post office. Every Saturday night, you know. <laughs> I'm going to bring this section to a conclusion. We've got about 10, 15 minutes left. Um, Mary Dorothy has to say anything. But well, I, Say something. Well, when she was talking about people, it made me think of how people do judge you, even in this country, to a great uh, degree. Because back in the 60s, we were having a meeting. There were about 25 or 30 people just like this, you know, sitting around. And our neighbors came after us with rifles. We had to call the police. Rifles? rifles. Yes, rifles. Rifles. So where was this? In Augusta. Augusta, Georgia. And okay. uh, we had we had to call the police. Uh, it, it was, and the, they said the only reason they didn't dynamite the house was because there were children in it. They were, they knew there were children. And this is something happened, you know, to us in our lifetime many 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 years ago. And this was back in Augusta, and to meet uh, in mixed groups like this was not always wow. easy. It was hard to find a place, and. Uh, it was our homes, so we were always at risk. And I'm just bringing that out to show you that uh, uh, there is judgment, you know. That maybe something they wouldn't do quite that today, but they sure did it then, you know. Uh, I thought there was judgment now with, you know, the bombing or absolutely. here in this country of absolutely. the Jewish yeah. synagogues absolutely. and of the <clears throat> mosque. And, you know, we shoot up Christian churches. Mm -hmm. Christians shoot up Christian churches, too, so. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. But I look at it this way. It's progressive revelation. It's like going from first grade to second grade to third grade every time a manifestation appears. You don't give up what you learned in first grade and second grade or third grade. You take it with you. And then you have more knowledge added to that. And because we progress spiritually too, not just materially. That's how I, I you know, see it. Good point. This is the final class of the class series. Uh, we'll be starting again July 12th. So there's going to be another A class series starting July 12th. Um, I have covered about half that I have prepared for the class. So, what have you learned? This is a world religion class, comparative religion. You learned that uh, the Jains have naked priests. How <laughs> 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 okay. did they pull their hair out to be nun? And yet, a nun has to have her hair pulled out. Um, what else did you learn? Okay. Uh, I learned a lot of historical facts that I didn't know. Not, I mean, it's, it's, it's spiritual and religion, but just... Does one spring to mind? What was, the, what was that one that I was, I was asking? About? There, was, there were several, I, I can, but I can't... You I could can't, do an entire eight-week series just on the development of Christianity in Europe in the 1500s. I think it was that, the yeah. Mayan temples and... and yeah. Okay, we covered Indian yeah. things. We discovered that the Indians were not savages, that in many ways their philosophy was superior to anything in Europe. Mm -hmm. um, the Mayan Indians have messianic prophecies. That's one of the... <clears throat> I started out with a quiz. And the quiz was, which religion teaches the golden rule? And the answer is, they all do. Mm -hmm. So just, just at that, there should be cooperation. There should be uh, friendship and fellowship. I've got other presentations like that where I put a quote up on the board and you try to guess what religion it's from. Which religion teaches that I am the way to God? They all do. Which religion teaches that I am the way to salvation? They all do. Which religion teaches um, I'm the way and the truth and the life. They all do. Um, so
So instead of being in competition with each other, maybe they're actually all part of the same process. Uh, it was pointed out that in the Bible, in the Old Testament, there are 48 prophets. So which prophet did Jesus deny? No, he recognized the process. From age to age, a child is born. At a certain point in his life, the voice speaks through him, and it's the same voice that speaks through all of them. Uh, the same voice that spoke through Moses also spoke through Jesus. Um, so what I'm trying to uh, illustrate to you here is that we actually have more in common than we are different, mm -hmm. and that the uh, problems that humanity has had in the past with things like uh, race hatred, national hatred, uh, interreligious hatred, um, slavery, uh, the suppression of the rights of women, um, these things are all things of the past. Um, that this is the age which we'll see the coming together, as Isaiah said, of the one fold and the one shepherd. Uh, all the nations and races of the world, we're pretty much there in this country where um, uh, racism is not very popular anymore. So, and that's a good thing. Um, the rise of the status of women. Um, you know, there are things, I just made a presentation last night. Uh, 11 things that women were not allowed to do in the 1960s. And it's silly stuff, like get a bank account. Um, mm -hmm. You know, be an attorney. Uh, take birth control pills. Uh, you know, these kind of things. Uh, so the rise of the status of women, particularly since the 1960s, has risen uh, amazingly. It's very hard to get a credit card. True. <laughs> yep. yep. Um, and as we saw last week in the news, women in countries like Saudi Arabia are not willing to take the way things used to be. Um, so there's even movements in the most oppressive uh, fundamentalist countries for women to gain the rights. Same thing is true of, uh, of the races of the world. Um, so I guess um, if if you got no more than that out of this class, and I think that I pretty much succeeded. I've got a whole bunch more that I could share with you, but you cannot bear it now. <laughs> um, so what other things that people learn? We talked about uh, Hindu, we talked about Buddhist, we talked about Zoroastrian. Most people have never heard of Zoroaster. Um, Moses, the Hebrew prophets, Jesus, Muhammad. Um, Muhammad was, the analogy I like to use is, was the, um, was the Moses to Arabia. Islam is a monotheistic religion that goes back to Abraham, uh, the God of Abraham, the God of Jesus. Uh, Jesus and the uh, prophets are all spoken of in the Quran. So the difference between Judaism and Islam is that uh, Islam believes in Jesus. Judaism does, does not. Judaism and Islam both have a code of the laws. You know, Moses and Muhammad didn't sit down and make a list of laws that they wanted. These are things that were compiled later on. Um, almost immediately upon the death of Muhammad, Islam split and has continued splitting ever since then. There are literally hundreds of sects. So when you talk about uh, Islam, there's no such thing as Islam. There's Islam, but then again, if there's a hundred different Islams, which one is Islam? Uh, the same thing is true of Christianity. And the same thing is true of, of, of Judaism. You have the whole spectrum of belief in Judaism and Christianity and Islam. Well, um, as, as culture changes, so do beliefs to the churches also mm -hmm. start to split and, and different. It's happening in our church right now. You know, oh yeah, there's a United Methodist Church. There's well, it's United Methodist Church, but the United Methodist Church is is 
not in total agreement right now yeah. on uh, uh, homosexuality on as things well. of um, homosexuality and um, um, gender identification, yeah. that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, there's there's a lot of um, things going on inside, the, and and that has happened through the years. That's how churches have separated and and gone into, you know. Well, it pretty much comes down to, do you believe that all people have human rights? Mm -hmm. That's right under law. That's what it comes down to. So. Well, and there's some that say no. It's not so that it's, simple when you get into it. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's difficult being human. You get into um, it. Um, really the 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 but I'm just saying that that happens in religions. That yeah. Our culture religions. Uh, defines sort of how they right. end up splitting off. That's why there's so many, um, right. because they've split off over various um, cultural differences. Right. And then this is another way to say it is they evolve. They, they evolve, they change. They, mm -hmm. you know, they, they change. Evolve or devolve. Yeah, yeah. Evolve. Yeah. Evolve. Yeah. 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 Are you aware that? There's evidence that Buddha made some predictions about Jesus Christ. Well, set up the Zoroastrians, and why would they not? In, in Cambodia today, I know some that, that uh, have some, some work over there, yeah. and they're baptizing Buddhists by the hundreds, even Buddhist priests are acknowledging mm -hmm. yeah. that, that Buddha, Buddha was contemporary with the prophet Daniel in the Old Testament, yes. but Daniel was an old man and Buddha was, was yes. a young man. And there's a very interesting story about that, about Buddha even describing the nail, the nail marks on Jesus in the crucifixion. And he said that all true Buddhists should accept this one when he comes, yeah. about 500 years later, which would correspond with Jesus Christ. Yes. Well, Zoroaster said that three prophets have come at about roughly a thousand year intervals, and the first one was, was Jesus. So, and the speculation is that the Magi who came to see the infant Jesus were Zoroastrian priests. Well, that came from that part of the world. That's, yeah. yeah, that definitely did. So, in fact, there's even statements in um, the Arabic Gospel of the Infancy of Jesus where it calls the Magi Zoroastrians. So, the point is then is that apparently, from age to age across the entire planet, these prophets were arising, giving these teachings and saying, I got a message for you. You're supposed to conform your life to this message. And then part of their teachings is, and by the way, there's more to come. There's another guy coming. So Buddha said, I am not the first Buddha to appear, nor shall I be the last. In due time, a supremely enlightened Buddha will appear. Uh, Zoroaster talked about the coming of the three prophets at about a thousand year intervals. The first, most people view as Jesus. The second was Muhammad. Um, most of the Zoroastrian <coughs> of Iran have become Baha'is because they recognize Baha'u'llah as the third. Um, <coughs> Krishna said, uh, whenever there is decline of righteousness and there is a growth of unrighteousness, then I myself return. I am born from age to age. This is the story of religion, that from age to age a prophet comes. So Krishna, Buddha, Zoroaster, of course, there's Messianic prophecies in <coughs> Judaism and in Christianity. Um, third chapter of the Gospel of, of the Book of Revelation, uh, Jesus is warning people not to be deceived. He said, false prophets will arise to deceive even the very elect. And that's in Matthew 24. In the third chapter of the Book of Revelation, he says, he that overcomes being deceived, I will write upon him my name, the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, which comes down from heaven, and I will write upon him my own new name. So even Jesus says that I am coming with a new name. So using the analogy of uh, the return of Elijah, his return is the birth of John the Baptist, you can see the process. That from age to age a prophet is born, and the same voice speaks through all of them. Um, what is some of the material, your new material? What is it? Okay. I've got quite a few things on the Bible. Um, Do you have 
other religions to cover other? Um, I didn't cover Buddhism very much. I uh, didn't really cover Hinduism very much. We took an entire day and went on uh, Sikh and Jain and Aghori. Um, all three are Indian, kind of Hindu, but not really. Um, when you get off into the, um, the gurus, a guru who leads a religious group, anything that he says is the truth. I tried to focus more on the religions of the book. So the Hindu book of Krishna is the Bhagavad Gita. At least there you have a standard that you can refer back to. A guru, anything that he says is the truth. So that's kind of where uh, Sikh and Jain and Aghori and these kind of groups, you know, somebody somewhere along the line said, male priests should be naked. That's not in any holy book. <laughs> But they do it. So, um, is it crazy? I think so. The, well, they, yeah, you can all, that's where you could think about maybe a false prophet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that might not be sure. it. So, um, I was just curious what other religions you expect to. I'd be willing to do anything that you would like to <clears throat> learn about or know about. Um, so, I didn't really cover Islam very much. Mm. Um, and we had a conversation briefly last week about Aisha, that you called mm -hmm. Muhammad a pedophile because he married a seven-year-old girl. Aisha was the daughter of Muhammad's, one of his most staunch friends, Abu Baker. And Aisha was, to cement the alliance, Muhammad had 11 wives. Aisha was a girl given to Muhammad as a wife. But she stayed in her father's household until she reached maturity. Uh, there's a disagreement about how old she was. Some people say she was 12, some say 15, some say 17. Some say 19. Maybe. Some, yes. Um, so in Middle Eastern culture, particularly in the 600s, women were married off as soon as they hit puberty. Uh, so was she sexually abused? Was he a pedophile? If you look at Aisha's life, there's no indication. Uh, she was probably the most brilliant woman in Arabia. Uh, she was sat, he was Muhammad, she was Muhammad's favorite wife. Uh, she sat at his feet and learned directly from him. She was an expert in the Quran. And Aisha was one of the chief compilers of hadith, the sayings of Muhammad. Uh, she was a brilliant woman. She never had children. She never had children. Two of Muhammad's wives had children. He had 11 wives but only two had children. She never had children, and when he died, she lived more than 40 years more, and she never remarried. So uh, she was totally devoted to Muhammad. So how do you get pedophile out of that? Um, but that many wives, they must, he must have each had a purpose. They must have each had well, something. Well, these were political alliances, and these are women <coughs> whose husbands have been killed in battle. So without his protection, they would have been destitute. And one was his son's wife that he had a special dispensation that she could divorce her husband and marry him, even though that was against Islamic law. Okay. Um, so we could talk more, more about Muhammad. Um, Muhammad himself said Islam is split into 73 sects. There are statements within Islam that uh, the Islamic leaders will become the most corrupt leaders on the face of the earth. Uh, a statement from Muhammad himself. Um, so what you see today is, it's not Islam. It's, it has nothing to do with the religion that Muhammad brought. Um, I don't know. Do you mean like the behaviors of the violence and so, or do you mean in general? Well, None. Uh, Muhammad and his followers so, were attacked. They fucked out. Um, so Muhammad is not like Joshua. You know, Joshua was told to destroy Jericho. Every man, every child, big dog, horse, no donkey. Um, so you can't really compare Muhammad with uh, Jesus or Moses. 
He had to fight for his life, literally. <laughs> For the purpose of this class, I'm neutral. How you get to